Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin, there are a couple basic housekeeping items. We want to bring your attention to an important update to our conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York session, H being the remaining one, on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, but we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. If so, if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click the closed caption box at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in your social media posts to help spread awareness of the conference. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year once they have been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome Dr. Temi Agbalakin, who is a professor of construction management and disaster resilience, and Dr. Olufasayo, Ada Dohun, who has over 15 years of combined industry and academic experience in quantity surveying, sustainable developments, and disaster resilience in both Australia and Nigeria. They are both researchers at the University of Newcastle, Australia, and join us to discuss community resilience in animal evacuation in rural and isolated communities. Welcome. Thank you very much for that um, nice introduction. We do appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to start with the presentation and thank you for giving us this opportunity to be here to present part of the work that we do here in New South Wales, Australia. Um, the title of the presentation for us today is looking at community resilience, the role of community resilience in animal evacuation, especially for rural and isolated communities when disaster strikes. And joining me today is my colleague, uh, Dr. Fisayo Adedokun from um, uh, University of Newcastle and myself. Uh, she, he works with, along with me and other people on this project. Uh, so he will be working, we will be presenting on this particular work around community resilience and how it's actually been able, it's featured in rural communities during uh, evacuation. So before um, I go ahead, as part of the uh, tradition here in Australia, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which the university resides and pay respect to the elders past, present and imagined. I would also like to extend this acknowledgement to the Awakabal and Warimai people of the land in which the university and Newcastle City campuses reside and which I work and where I am making my presentation today. The University of Newcastle recognizes the First Nations people of this country and their ongoing connection to culture and country. We do acknowledge First Nations of people as traditional owners, custodians and law keepers of the world holders living culture. And we pay our respects to their past, um, to their elders past, present and imagined. Another thing that is also key to our work is that we have to acknowledge the national uh, Australian government as part of the funding for this particular work that is presented here, which actually forms a small part of a larger project in which was funded by the Australian government. And then yet, yeah, and then next is to talk about you know what brought us here is about the you know the project itself. So my uh, pro presentation outline is about the you know the overview of the whole project as a, as a whole and how this particular work features in it, and also give an introduction to the background why isolated communities, why you know livestock management in this area, and what are the objectives we are trying to look for, the methodology that we've applied, and our findings today. This is still an ongoing. 
a project that is still live and what are the you know policy implications that we have found including some recommendations and we just close up with a summary so this project was funded under the bushfire funding stream and it's called the climate smart multi-hazard approach for an animal evacuation as we all know that in in australia recently we've been having cascading disasters you know almost every three months there's one disaster emergency that we have to approach or we have to walk through uh, since 2019 2020 bushfire we've got bush though the big bushfires we've got covid we've got flooding almost every six months that are if uh, you know impacted the same community and then this brought about this um, idea that we need to start thinking about a multi-hazard approach rather than looking at this hazard um you know, as an individual um, event or as an individual entity. So we put together this project that, you know, aim to look at a co-creation and adopting a multi-hazard approach to investigate infrastructure assessment, operational capacity of, of animal safe places to support effective animal evacuation planning. And we've got two streams, which I said this, this um, particular presentation here or this objective we're presenting here is just a small, aspect of the project. So the first stream is looking at how do we enable infrastructure, um, infrastructure upgrade or infrastructure improvement for efficient evacuation and in managing animals in emergencies. We have seen what has happened. At, I'm sure that a lot of presenters would have talked about it, about how do we manage, you know, big, especially large animals in, in disaster. We did not have, generally Australia didn't have a plan for that until uh, the last bushfire where it was picked up in, um, in the Royal Commission report, where it was where it was uh, mandated that every um, local region, every region should have um, should identify pre-identify animal safe places to support a, a, a effective animal evacuation for large livestock animals. And then we also thought in the stream too that apart from the infrastructural improvement upgrade, we also need to start thinking about improving community communications engagement capacities and capability in terms of you know operating when in this new um, era. So why is this um why is this project important? We know that we have to better prepare. This is an era of disasters, especially when it comes to the impacts of climate change in our region and other disruptive events. We have to be prepared. We do not have a choice. We do not have a choice now because we can't wait to join, you know, adopt the response and response approach. We have to be now more proactive and have some plan in place. And we also need to build a necessary response and recovery capacity and capability um, capability at local levels. We don't want to leave everything to the state level and say, oh, the state or the government level has to provide provisions. But what can we do? How do we improve our capacity and capability at the local levels, whether at the LGA levels or at the you know, um, individual community levels or individual as a person to be able to prepare and respond and recover post a disaster and also to develop the necessary connections and relationships that can help us to cope with, to plan and also to recover from any impacts of any disruptive event. We know that recovery, a, a effective recovery is largely due on you know, when you are properly prepared, you know, for those disasters and those disruptive events, if you're not properly prepared, recovery is going to take longer. And the, with the era of disasters that we are now, especially with climate change, we have to develop that our connections in able to be able to say we have that, you know, that immunity to be able to, you know, bounce back better after every disruptive uh, event. So this is what gave back to this project. And then uh, we know I'm sure that this has would have been repeated so many times that the 2019, 2020 bushfire was really bad for agricultural community. Billions of animals resulting in billions of losses for that sector. And also we know that the flooding has not been friendly to us in Australia in the last two years. Hundreds of thousands of animals have died. Lots of economic impacts on livestock farmers, especially the small to medium scale. Even the large scale farmers are, you know, also uh, affected. And then what we found is that there is a lack of approved safe evacuation places. People just take their animals, they show up, you know, in, in human evacuation centers, they show up in, in open fields and all that. So there is a lack of approved safe evacuation places. So why we understand that you can turn up anywhere you want to turn up with your animals as long as it's allowed you. But we also understand that some of these areas that are available for people to put their animals during disasters are not particularly safe for different uh, for instance, an area could be safe for uh, flooding, but may not be safe from disasters. And a lot of people have turned up in areas where they they, deem, they think it's safe, but however, it wasn't safe during a particular disaster event. Often, large and stock, uh, large, large livestock farmers can't evacuate their animals. This is area a, a really shocking um, outcome that we found when we're doing this project. That large uh, is very very difficult for 
farmers in isolated communities to evacuate the animals. Number one, they already cut off the, 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 the grounds. Um, access to their site is already blocked, so they can't even leave three weeks to, to, to the event. So how would, they, how would evacuation be possible? For those, yeah, for those farmers in peri-urban areas, it's easier, it could be easier for them to evacuate if they have necessary facilities uh, in place and they understand or they know they, or they already train the animals or train themselves in the, in, to understand the evacuation routes and you know, apply that route so many times to, you know, to be able to go back to that site if there's an emergency happen. But what happens to you know, isolated communities where emergency operators or services, people can't even reach them in disaster. They are totally cut off. Either they are underwater or they have been isolated as a result of the um, fire spread. So it's not um, viable or it's not visible for them to actually evacuate. So this is one of the things that we need to start thinking about a different innovative approach on how do we help um, uh, farmers in this particular region, you know, best manage their own evacuation evacuation scenarios or evacuation planning. And we found that the sources of animal evacuation um, in, in, and response operations in this particular region depends on the level of their community resilience. How has the community been working together? What have they been doing before they've actually boasted or helped each other to be able to overcome some of these challenges? So um, we were able to come up with two, um, two uh, three objectives. First is to understand the role of community resilience. How does it play? How does it help? And also the first thing we think about what are these challenges faced by these livestock farmers within this region? We need to understand their challenges before we are able to say, okay, let's now come together and foster a, a, a solution. Then we want to investigate the role of community resilience, like I mentioned, and also identify what are these existing community-led initiatives that is working in a particular community and is not visible to other community. What can we learn as researchers? You know, what can we improve? What can the government improve? What can the government fund to make evacuation, you know, owned by this community a better approach? And also, how can other communities learn from the communities that have implemented something that has really worked for them um, before and also during this uh, current um, era that we have now? So we put together, um, as part of this project, we did three uh, focus group workshops in rural communities um, early this year. So we went to three places, Whittingham, Mid Coast, and also uh, the Moland, where we hold uh, the Moland Cottage, where we actually had. Uh, the meetings. So we have um, participants ranging between landowners, which we call livestock farmers here in Australia, the hobby farmers, which is the small scale, you know, I love animals, I just want to keep a couple in my on my land, and they do have the and they have block um, block uh, block farms or block uh, sections. And also we have the agricultural producers. We have the local land offices, local council officers, the land care groups, women in daring. We have people uh, supporting our project in government agencies, such as an NGO, such as Farmgate, local land services, which is a, a major partner in this project. We have the um, the desired star response team from the welfare. We also have NEMA, which is one of our major, uh, the main funder of this organization, both at national, and also at state levels, and we had a lot of support and a lot of participants in the in the in all our focus groups. And then, what are the major findings that we found? First, that we found that most people who live, most communities in um, in rural communities or isolated, are always vulnerable. Not all of them, not the whole of their region, but most times, they are always vulnerable to either bushfire, flooding, um, name it wind, and all that you know, and they require evacuation. But because, like I mentioned before, they can't evacuate because most times the access has been caught and also evacuation is not visible. But what we find interesting is that their priority is to save their livestock. And, you know, their, uh, and also their re and other um, relevant facilities like their milking stations over their home. Home is, is generally neglected while the focus is on, you know, saving the animals. And most times they find a lack of preparedness plans. A lot of them, Apart from those who have been in this in the same region for years, over ten years, um, uh, have some level of preparedness plans in place. So most times they don't have inadequate feed, they don't have access to water, they don't even have um, access to emergency contacts, especially for the newbies that have been, they just you know moved into the region or bought a new farm in that area. And often at times they are fat there's issues of fatigue and mental health issues because of you know the reoccurring um, cascading hazard that um, disasters they've been experiencing. A lot of them are fatigued, a lot of them are stressed out, and you know the issues around mental health also. One major thing that we that was reoccurring in all the three workshops 
and the and the participant is the lack of adequate and adequate risk information sharing. They don't normally they are cut off, so they have they don't have access. Even the information that they are being provided by emergency services are not detailed enough. So they have to rely on their own investigation, on their own how do we access information. Some of them that have been in the region for long have developed a system where they have developed relationships with people in SES. They have direct contacts of people they can call. They do have access to a uh, boom where they check the weather forecast. And some of them have um, local knowledge of, you know, how, how to check the water levels, check the river basin and all that. Then they also complain about the early warning system, which I just talked about, that they don't get information unless they use their own um, local knowledge that they have or go out there to check. And sometimes it might be too dangerous. Then they, we all had issues of inter, poor interagency coordination. So we have different agencies come down trying to do the same thing. Everybody's confused at the initial stage until they get things in order. Um, this is post, not even in emergency response, this is post emergency. And they do mention that their local local land services have been helpful and handed within their own region and LGA. I have a, they, they, they require for more help because most times the local land services people, uh, which is within their region or within their LGA, can't even come to them once um, the disaster, uh, once an emergency. Um, is initiated and nobody can actually reach them. And then one thing that was also important is the lack of equipment to prepare. This is what I term in mitigations and adaptations. How can I make my farm to be better prepared? Do I have good sprinklers? Do I have, you know, the use of, do I want to use concrete um, PVC tanks other than um, uh, plastic tanks, which is not, uh, which is not advised during um, disaster emergencies. And also the high cost of insurance and delay in claiming in, 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 in processing claims to kickstart recovery, most times their recovery spans into months. And before they recover from that, before they could get you know, some claim from the insurance, they already have another bushfire or another you know, disaster. So it's been a roller coaster for them. And a lot of them do mention that they need more training in terms of farming, farm emergency planning. How do I plan my farm in such a way that it allows water to drain hard quickly? How do I plan my farm in such a way where I have, I can design an area or identify an area where I can keep my, that is an, I, I, you know, I, I had high ground where I can keep my farm. And also a lot of them have no, and uh, they have no, um, they have poor animal pet information record keeping and ident identification. The, some of the animals or most of the animals don't even have tags. And when they are being rescued, you know, they don't know where to, how do we return them? Who owns these animals and all that. And many a times, even if they have anything, any paperwork done, a lot of them are being lost in, in, in that, in the fire or in the flooding. So, you know, they need more information on, I need more training on how do I better prepare my, my company or my farm you know, in terms of disaster in order to respond very well. Then some of the things that were interesting that I found in this project is about, you know, what are the community-led initiatives that enhances their, 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 their disaster experience? And what we found very important is the, what I call the social, use of existing social capital or community connections within their community. A lot of them do have lived experiences and they have developed their own innovative response strategies, which I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about. So one of the, um, one of the, and uh, community, which is the Whittingham community, actually um, came to a workshop and they gave a presentation of what they have been doing and how it has worked for them. So what they did was to develop a hub within their community. They have a list of, they have not all the lists, but they have a lot of uh, lists of a lot of people that live in that region. And they divide them themselves into the hubs, which are about 10 households of farmers. And they have, they nominated one person to communicate with the overall head. So they have an overall head within the community that communicates with the emergency services, tells them you know, who needs evacuation, what they need, whether they need food and safety. Then within each hub, they have a caretaker who looked out for each other. Have you heard from Mr. A today? Have you heard from Mr. B today? What does Mr. A, do they need food? You know, do they need fees? Do they need water? Do they need to be evacuated at this stage? And what they have done that was really impressive was that they created their own uh, within their community where they have high, some high places that they know is not likely to be uh, flooded, they have what they call the alternate evacuation places where they, you know, oh, Mr. A, could, I could take my animals to Mr. A or Mr. B, where I know that his area is not going to be flooded, or we have alternate milking station, which is prepared beforehand. So within their community, they've been able to organize themselves, you know, in such a way that during disaster, they're able to look after one another. And then they also uh, implement a good communication management. We, we found that they do understand situation awareness of events. They understand the high grounds. They know how to monitor their river levels, their river basins. 
And then they were able to develop a friend, develop relationship and contact with the emergency services where they can contact them directly and say, this is where we are, this is what is going on. And funny enough, they hold daily briefings to update each other on what is going on. And once um, there is flooding or there's bushfire, they, they lose all their um, internet connection and all that, but they've developed their own system where they have satellite radios and UHF radios to communicate with one another, which I personally found um, I'm impressive that they've been able to communicate despite the fact that even we, you know, can get hold of them most times. And then they do have people outside, you know, in other communities which actually help them upload some of their information on, on Facebook page where people can say, okay, my, they can have their families, you know, outside that community can have rest of mind that they are doing very well. So they develop a system where they can communicate with themselves within that community, even though they are caught up. And then also a system where they can actually now communicate with outside people who are outside their community, especially family and friends who might be worried that, okay, this is where we are. This is what we're doing. We'll give a daily briefing on what, how we're doing, which I think was very, very good. Then what we found that they really are looking up to, to, you know, to say, okay, we need more in, in terms of what we have done so far is how do we plan ahead? You know, how do we strengthen our community network? We have a lot of people are selling and so a lot of people are buying, new people coming in, and it's been very difficult, you know, to bring that new group together. How do we empower our landowners with information and tools? They have a, we have a huge number of people we call the hobby farmers, which have very um, small animals. We call them, you know, probably the small SMEs who have less than five or 10 animals. And this is where it becomes very um uh, I would say very dicey where a lot of these hobby farmers do not have the resources or the trainings or even the awareness of how to look after the animals and disasters. They don't even have access to training or emergency plan. They don't even have insurance. Most times they're always at a loss on what to do during disaster. And uh, it's not left on the community or the big farmers to actually now hold their hand and um, help them. What we found out is that this particular group of um, big farmers are already exhausted. So looking after another person, helping them with the animal become an additional stress. And they're thinking if we could help raise awareness, provide that training will be, uh, will really be good to, you know, to keep them abreast of all the information they need. And also they, 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 they want to do more, they want to document or do more about undertaking adaptation measures. So what we found is that they have their own adaptation measure where they use their livestock you know, to to they do they have their look uh, the local grazing system in which you know you bring your livestock to my farm to help with grazing. You, I bring so that there is a system that we put in place which is not been documented, and also their their uh, their their burning system in which actually reduces uh, bushfire impact which they are uh, currently undergoing. And I'm sure that there's there's some couple of research in that indigenous um burning systems at the, at the moment. And another thing they want more is more awareness for new entrants. I've mentioned that. And particularly the, the big missing link is the community consultation. So they said that a lot of times they're not being um they're not being um consulted on policies or or strategies that have been designed for them. So a lot of times there is this um there is this lack of trust between the community members and the agency. So we are calling now on this is a, a major finding that. It's not as if the community does not work, want to work with government agencies, but they want more consultation. They want to be involved in, in, in decisions or in policies that, you know, that affects them and also be able to contribute in this whole process. So they are looking at a collaboration and a co-creation with, uh, with our local agencies. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just go through the recommendations and uh, quickly. So I think the baseline for us from what we found is that some communities know what they're doing. They've been able to get their acts together and some are struggling. Some have no plan at all. They don't even meet. Everybody is on their own. And if um, at, at, at the state level, national level, if for us to establish a guideline, you know, how do communities develop social resident networks? There have been some effort at um, in New South Wales to for, I think there's a, I think it was Red Cross or Resident New South Wales that's um, working on. There's a mandate that they should develop social resident work networks within communities. But what we found is that some local councils are doing it especially the recovery officers, some are not doing it. And then the approaches are different and they do, I'm sure the results are going to be different, but this actually tells us that there is a need for some level of funding at that, um, at that um, communities to be able to develop a workable solution. You know, what are the guidelines for them to be able to set up something up that is sustainable and not dependent on the government. And also we talked about um, consultation and then also we need a lot of animal related awareness campaigns people need to understand that okay the 
um, animal evacuation is possible, is visible for some regions and it's also not visible for some communities. You know, where do you take your animals to? What do you do in terms of, you know, when you know that um, water level is increasing? What do you do within your own farm area? And what do you do even as a pet owner during disasters? And also to enhance animal wealth, animal health and welfare in rural communities, which is, I will say, um, not very, very adequate at the moment and also provide more um, information and awareness training programs in order to improve their level of preparedness. And then uh, we talked about the, uh, the policy implication. How does some of the outcomes of this research? This is just one bite of the work we do. Um, so we, we, we knew from the answer that this work has to you know, inform policy, which is part of the requirement. So we, from this particular work, we think that integrating animals into disaster management planning across all jurisdictions and communities and across all levels of government is important as part of the national planning principles um, for animals and disaster. This is this has started, but I know that it's always about response, response, response. But animal, the planning itself is very key because once you have a proper plan in place, then response is easier and recovery is faster, and then we can build back better. And also establishing a coordinated whole state government national approach to integrate animals in emergency planning, like I've mentioned, which is which aligns with the national strategy for um, disaster resilience and also consulting communities. We can sit in our offices, we can sit in our, in our agencies or universities, and they will say we want to develop uh, we want to develop procedures, we want to develop policies for people who are isolated because their cases are usually different. This is one of the things I found very interesting. This, their approach is different, their communities are different, and we need to actually em em engage them properly using, you know, in line with the community engagement frameworks that everybody is important and we have to engage them at the level that they want to be engaged. I think that is all. I will we'll leave all that to, you know, questions and answers. So if you want more quest, if you want more information about this project, this is my email and our project website is up there. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, please do add them to the Q&A box. Wonderful. And of course, all of our speakers' bios and contact information can be found on our website, as long, along with an abstract of their presentations. And that is www.gadmc.org slash speakers. So you can certainly reach out directly to them. They would be more than happy to answer any questions. We don't, oh, we do have one. Oh, oh there they are. <laughs> um, so uh, Renee shares her personal experience and says, one of the issues I have faced during evacuation is that the areas available to take animals to are not open or accessible prior to the actual event, especially in the greater Sydney area. This makes evacuation of livestock difficult when access routes will be cut off when the time comes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was a very good one. So part of this project, like I mentioned before, is the, um, uh, is the identification, which is the infrastructure. So um, we, we finished the, that part of the work. So what we did in that project is to, although we did a, our own work on Hunter region, which I think is, is should, could be extend to the other parts of New, um, New South Wales. So what we did is to identify potential areas of all potential safe places that you can put animals to. And actually now we did a um, hazard, multi-hazard vulnerability on those regions, on those areas to say, and recommend to SES and local land services that these are the areas that you could use during flooding. These are the areas that you could use during um, bushfire. These are the areas you could use during um, tornadoes and all that. But in overall, we have identified five um, top places that could be useful. And um, we have some councils have you know, start adopting this uh, our research. And some of them are actually con uh, being recommended for upgrade. So they are being uh, upgraded, uh, upgraded at the moment. So a lot of councils have started advertising that within our region. So we develop what we call the animal safe place register. So the register works with all is with the local, uh, the look, they are, uh, will be with the limo is an addendum to the emergency management plan for our region where the safety, the emergency services operators could actually have access to all the centers, the, 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 
they, they know where the keys are in the in the safe plan. We have a summary that we have the keys, you know, where you can pick up the keys, where you know which area you need to go to, who you need to contact, numbers, everything are there. So it will actually prevent the issues of where you turn up there and there's nobody there. And the next phase of our project up in terms of infrastructure is now to train those facility managers so that they can begin to work with emergency operators. So they would develop their own emergency management plan for their center. Well, so they have a guideline which they'll put on the fridge on the wall for you when you come in and then you see, okay, once there's an evacuation, this is what you need to do. This is how to, you know, open up the site and all that for this particular center because all centers are different. So we, this is still within the, um, New, um, the Hunter region and hopefully we can extend it to the rest of, um, uh, to Sydney and the rest of um, New South Wales. Wonderful. There, we have one other question and then unfortunately we need to move on because we could certainly stay on this topic a while longer. What resources do you recommend for responders like veterinarians who are not trained in psychology to be able to support the public and themselves better? Yes, this is very difficult. So we are we in, in our research team, we have we have veterinarians, we are working with DPI, we are working with um, Hunter Local Land Services. So what we are doing, as, like I mentioned before, we are running our trainings for all everyone involved in animal evacuation. So this is what we are running out the training and we are working with um, different private organizations and then the, the state government organizations as well. So we are going to develop a guideline towards the end, middle of next year, we should get it out, which is the last phase of our research, in order to say, when you are involved in animal evacuation, this is the A and Bs. And most importantly, the facility owners will have to be there with you. If you want to use their facilities, they understand because some of these places are already being used for animals. They are, you know, they know how to tend to animals. They have their own vet. They have their own uh, managers on ground. They will be able to assist in how to calm the animals down because if you don't want to see, you know, animals in disasters because they, even though their emotions run everywhere, so they're already trained in the use of animals. And this, so we are part of our recommendation is that this training should be, you know, ongoing. Like part of what we say that every six months I would do a fire drill. Let's, you know, we know the season now. We're expecting, we are expecting bushfire. Everybody's running around. We're preparing, you know, for the next season. So this, you know, we go there. We do our our routine check. Is the center, you know, is the center able to be used? Are we are we going to have a, another drill, you know, in preparing for the next? or the next bushfire, you know you're going to be on call. A lot of people, you know, so if you don't know you're going to be on call, then you, Queensland now is doing something that we recommend for New South Wales. Let's get a list of all the suppliers, people that can be um, available in disaster responses. And then we bring everyone, but we train everyone, we run through the training before the disaster. Then we are all aligned together when it happens. Wonderful. Dr. Tammy, thank you so much for joining us. And Olu Husayo, I'm so sorry we didn't get to sorry. <laughs> hear or, or see you, actually. Um, thank you so much for presenting with us today.